My name is Brad Reed. I'm on the accounting faculty here at SIUE. And on, on SIUE's behalf, I'd like to welcome you all here this morning. In the audience today, we have many students, alumni, faculty, and members of the business community. And we appreciate all of you being here. Um, I'd like to thank a few people before we get going that helped put this together. We'd like to thank uh, Dean G. Martino, um, Gary, who's here. This is a. Uh, also, Judy Woodruff, our Director of Development. Judy's here. And, uh, and Gail, who uh, did all the details for the meeting and put it together. So. This has been a busy week. This is homecoming week with a lot of activities and uh, I'm sure they've been working hard putting all these things together. Um, also like to thank um, Professor Lovata, Linda, here. I believe it was her idea. I believe it was her idea for this topic and this meeting today. Now, one of the things you get after teaching a while, you get a sense when the audience doesn't understand something. I'm sure you have the same question I'm having. If this was her idea, why is she sitting out there? <laughs> and I am up here. But as in classes, some, some questions just can't be answered. Just move on. Um, we have three, uh, three guest speakers today that I'll introduce in a few minutes. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to introduce the topic a little bit and give a little bit of background. And then I'm going to introduce our three guests and turn the time over to them for some presentations at that point. So I'm sure most of you know there aren't many days or weeks go by that there aren't um, reports in the newspaper of some fraud case, uh, businesses losing large amounts of money or investors losing money. Seems to be a topic of much interest lately and uh, of growing interest and growing importance. And accounts and auditors have always played an important role in trying to prevent um, fraud at businesses, um, either by designing internal controls on the front end to prevent people from committing fraud, or by auditing to provide a deterrence or a detection mechanism if the fraud does occur. And so over time, and particularly in the last few years, this has become a, an area of growing importance for the auditing and accounting profession. Now, as Anse asked it from an internal audit perspective, I'd like to know, is anyone here in internal audit? Oh, okay, great. <laughs> All right. Um, I did start my career in public and fought for five years for Price Waterhouse. Um, I did start, start off as a staff auditor. Um, I did um, work my way up to a senior consultant before I left in, in the MIS area. Um, I'm very fortunate to have the education here at SIUE. It really prepared me for being um, an auditor at Price Waterhouse and also the, uh, the opportunities it lent me at that time. When I left Pricewaterhouse, I went to Anheuser-Busch, and that's when I started my internal auditing career. I really was started off as an IT auditor. Back in those days, we were called an EDP auditor, Electronic Data Processing Auditor, so I'm dating myself. Um, and I started there, and at that time, Anheuser-Busch definitely was a national company. It was internationally, but it wasn't known too much internationally. It definitely was a domestic giant here. Um, the, I was there 22 and a half years, and in that time it grew to be the largest brewer in the world, internationally, until it was bought out in 2008, the latter part of 2008. Um, I got a lot of opportunities being an internal audit to see a lot, and um, I have to admit it was a great experience. First of all, from an internal auditor's perspective, when it comes to fraud, Whose responsibility is it to, do, to detect fraud? And it's actually everyone's in the cor corporations or organization that you work in's responsibility to help detect and to prevent fraud. It starts from the very beginning of the board of directors. Um, do they have a good tone at the top that this type of behavior will not be acceptable? I was very fortunate to work at Anheuser-Busch. If anyone knows about the quality of that company, um, the very head top, the chairman of the board, August A. Bush III, was very much into internal controls. Quality was his main thing. I'm not saying by the company today, but I'm saying when I worked there, quality <laughs> was the word. And he, he made sure that we were, we had quality in everything we did. And he was very much interested in internal controls. During those years, yes, there were investigations done there. Yes, there were news stories, I'm sure if you remember, probably back in the 80s, there were some marketing executives that got in trouble and so forth. Um, just recently in the, in the 2000, around 2007, 2008, 
don't know if you remember on the news there was some some in, in inventory problems. So yes, there are problems, and you do want to help prevent those. But what you have to do, make sure there's good tone at the top, and making sure that management is has proper internal controls, and ensuring that employees are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, and reporting anything unusual. Um, I'm going to tell you a few stories that um, I accompanied while working at the brewery, um, and these aren't necessarily bad, but there's are things that happen. I mean, we all know that beer is made out of grains, right? Grains, water, and yeast. That's, that's beer. It's quite simple. But people don't realize that, yeah, you have this, can I step away from the podium? Absolutely. I, I like to walk. So, so um, um, it, it's made from grains, but then after, you know, you drink that liquid, you see that liquid, you know, there are a lot of grains left. Because the, they cook them, they mash them, and everything else, and there's grains left. So those are called spent grains, which means, you know, they're grains. So what do you think you do with those grains? Dispose of them. Dispose of them. But how do you think you dispose of them? Resell them on the secondary market. Correct. They were resold on the secondary market. Actually, they're sold to farmers. And actually, cattle eat them. So, you know, you got a lot of ha ha happy cattle around the world. <laughs> because they're, they're eating this grain. But that is... That spent grains, they go out to buy product of, of, of good products, and what do you do with it? Well, who cares? Well, there's a lot of money in that, believe it or not. So you have to be very careful. You have to ensure you have proper internal controls that when those spent grains are leaving, they're actually going to the farming, the farmers or whatever, and that you're actually getting paid for those spent grains. So what they have to do is they have to ensure that the trucks come in, the trucks are weighed, the spent grains are loaded onto the trucks, and then the trucks are weighed again. So then you know how much pounds of spent grains you have, and that's what you charge the vendors. We well, have to continuously watch that because there's always people who are manipulating that. As you know, everything, sorry, that light is really shining. <laughs> um, What's that? Just hit Hit one. B? Oh, thank you. Um, so you have to be careful because everything is, is controlled electronically within your system. So if whoever has access to the computer system can actually maybe change the weights, can maybe override something. So as an internal auditor, we always would make sure that we check how the, how the trucks are being weighed, are the scales being calibrated, and so forth. Those are good controls we ensure that it's being done which is actually the manager's responsibility for internal controls. We want to make sure that they're also doing that. So there is an example of that. That same example goes to with the finished goods. Now, you know, beer is shipped in cases, and the cases are on a pallet. So you see those big beer trucks? I mean, if you look inside that, that um, track, the, the trailer, I mean, it's just nothing but pallets of beer. That's all it is. So we had to make sure also are our employees stealing beer? You know, you're saying you're shipping all this beer to the wholesaler, because in America, a large brewer sells beer to a wholesaler, and a wholesaler then sells it to the retailer. So we want to make sure that whoever we're shipping to the wholesaler gets to the wholesaler. And it is a wholesaler's responsibility to verify their shipment when it comes in, but it's our responsibility to make sure what we're invoicing is correct too. So there's another way where they have to weigh trucks. They weigh the truck when it comes in, and with an empty trailer, they weigh it when, it, um, when it's going out, and they have a computer system to determine, okay, this is in a range of pounds that that's correct. That's probably how many pallets of beer are on that. And that's another control you have to ensure that employees cannot override that control within the system, and they would steal beer. <coughs> another um, part of what we had was the can manufacturing business. And you know, to make cans, it's made out of what? Aluminum. aluminum. Well, aluminum is a metal that it costs. There's no doubt about it. So you have to really worry about the scrap there. You also have to worry about um, our employees stealing. Um, I remember one time they had some aluminum shortages and they couldn't understand the plants. Why are we having all these aluminum shortages? We just purchased aluminum. Well, they found out they, they had cameras installed, they watch it, and actually some employees are actually backing up their pickup trucks to the dock and loading coils of aluminum on their trucks and going on. So I mean you have to continuously be monitoring. So it's another control. 
management has to continuously monitor their, their, their inventory. Now, theme parks. We had a theme park business, and tons of fraud can come in theme parks. Why? What's the number one thing in a theme park? Cash. What's the number one thing people can steal easily? It's cash. So, you know, and, and this is, don't take this um, bad, but <coughs> unfortunately also, you've got to remember that the individuals working at a theme park are usually younger individuals. It's their second job. They're just going to school or whatever. So, I mean, this is their great opportunity. They see all this cash coming through. Hey, I got to pay my school bills or whatever. They like to sell cash. So we have to continuously had to make sure that there were controls to help prevent that fraud of stealing cash. And there's very many ways you can steal cash at a theme park. Um, so um, we had to have actually our point of sale system. I'm sure you've heard of point of sale systems on the cash re re registers. We had to ensure that those controls are actually implemented correctly too. So a lot of this I'm going back to is with IT, which I know our gentleman's going to talk a little bit later about the forensics part of it. And you have to make sure there's proper internal controls within that area. Um, when I was there, I think in 2007, I don't know if you remember on the news, there was some inventory that was stolen in the IT area. There's another area that I think a lot of companies forget. Um, we have our information systems that help support our, 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 our organizations, and there's definitely tools that we have to use. But we forget that those have to be maintained. And you know, we all want to be up 24-7. So that means you do have to have inventory of spare parts. And those spare parts in IT actually can get expensive. It depends on what you're having. And I remember at that time, we actually had our corporate data center was in the corporate building. And um, that was on the third floor. And they actually had the spare parts stored on the first floor. And it was in a locked storeroom, but they were lax on their internal controls. Um, in, unfortunately, and this is not to pick on contractors, nothing wrong with contractors, employees are contractors, had access to this room. They had a car key badge, but they had access to this room. And they were going in that room, getting the spare parts, making sure the computers were always working all the time. But at the same time, they were actually were stealing. And people didn't realize it, because these were spare parts that were purchased and were expensive. Okay, so no one really kept track of the inventory. They just know we had to have these spare parts. And what, what did what we found out, actually this employee, uh, sorry, was a contractor, actually was coming in, going into the spare parts room, actually taking the spare parts out and actually selling them on eBay. So, I mean, it's amazing what employees can do and because they had access to it. So there's various ways that we can help as from an internal audit perspective time side to make sure that things do not happen. You mentioned earlier the ACFE about internal auditors and external auditors. I just want you to know that you have to, I'm an internal auditor and I believe in external auditors and work very closely with them. And you know, one of the comments was internal auditors find more than external auditors. And the only reason is, is internal auditors are there all the time. Nothing against external auditors, they are great. But they're only in there at a point in time External auditors only see a very small part. Now, external auditor comes and looks at my work as an internal auditor to see what I do so they can rely on that. So that's why internal auditors find more than external auditors. We're just there 100% of the time. But do I find everything? No. But should I be looking for fraud? Yes. So if I start an audit, before I start the audit, the audit team gets together and we sit in a room and we discuss fraud. What's the various ways that people could commit fraud in this department or this organization, wherever we're auditing at the time? And we go through all the fraud scenarios that we can think of. We also think of all the controls. And we have all these documents, we do have past history, but we ensure that before we start the audit. Then we link steps in our audit program to make sure that we're reviewing that, to ensure that hopefully we will catch fraud. But can we catch everything? No. Even as an internal auditor, I do not audit 100% of all transactions. I can't. I have to take a sample. Just like the external auditor, I have to take a sample. And so hopefully we can catch things. Also within the organization though, you want to make sure that senior management knows about fraud and risk. So one of the things is you want to make sure your corporation has a good risk management program. Coming from the top, going all the way down to all levels. You, ask, you, you should ensure that they are discussing fraud during their risk discussions amongst their employees. 
making sure employees are also educated on risk and fraud, making sure that they're aware of fraud, making sure your organization has every once in a while pop up on their in, on the internet saying, hey, do you know about fraud, or some reminders about fraud, uh, making sure that there's a hotline within the in your organization that an employee can call and not have to worry about the ramifications. A lot of times employees do see fraud, like you were saying earlier, over 40% of all fraud is because someone actually tells on someone else. And employees are scared. If they find their boss doing fraud, they're afraid to say anything because it's their job. So making sure that they have an outlet that they can call. Um, as an internal auditor, I try to look at fraud from the very beginning, also during the audit. Also, I'm involved in fraud investigations. Um, and that's when I will call Mr. Stringer sometimes for assistance, because I'm not an expert in forensics part of it, which you'll hear later. But I will actually will understand when I have to be called. Now, when I'm in a fraud investigation, I have a little different hat than as my internal auditor. So we have to handle the information differently in a fraud investigation, making sure, because most likely um, we would like to prosecute <coughs> after a fraud investigation. That is the number one deterrence of other employees doing it, if they hear that other employees actually lose their job or are being prosecuted. But now all the time we do that. When I am in a fraud investigation, I'm called in, and most likely the general auditors call first. Um, actually, it's for usually from our legal department, and then we all get involved and we have to handle the situation. But um, fraud cases are very in, in, interesting. If you're, um, if you're ever called upon to be on one, um, it really is a great opportunity. You learn so much, and it actually makes you wake up and think, boy, you know what? I should have been doing this from the internal audit side. I should have been looking at some of these things. Hi. Um, like Dr. Reed indicated, I, uh, my name is Christina Rother. Uh, I'm a manager at KPMG. I'm actually a new manager. I just got promoted over the summer. I've been there five years. Uh, so I just graduated from SIU five years ago. I had Dr. Reed, Dr. Koskin, Dr. Lovada. I thought I saw Mr. Brandt. Um, here as well. So I uh, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to come back and just give an external auditor's point of view of um, fraud. Now, I think one of the hardest things for a new auditor, especially an external auditor, to get their arms around is materiality. Because when you're an accounting student, if you don't round to the tenth decimal place, you'll get points taken off on your test. <laughs> so when you go to a client, and you see a hundred thousand dollar error for, that's fraud that's wrong but really depending on the size of the company and the assets that they have that might not be a big deal at all and so when I was a new associate that was probably one of the hardest things for me to understand that errors are made and it's not due to fraud and it's not due to even anybody doing something wrong it's just due to timing and resources and I think that that's something that really internal audit would focus on more like why those little errors are happening but from our perspective it's really not something that we focus on those little errors of course we have to consider how many little errors there are but in general you know that's not something we really focus on as also Dr. Reed talked about there's really three types of fraud and Theft and misappropriation of assets is definitely something that's very easily, that very easily happens in an organization. You know, people <coughs> skimming off the top from not having adequate controls or segregation of duties. Um, but there's also two other types that specifically I've dealt with. The first is corruption or employee conduct. And this is where it can kind of be a gray area because you don't, you know, maybe the person's intentions really weren't fraud but that's kind of how it happened. And an example that I dealt with um, just last year was that I had a client who issued debt and they were supposed to pay this debt with a certain revenue stream. Well, generally when you issue debt, the money goes into separate accounts. So they might have a construction account, um, a debt reserve account, and you know, an interest account, just different accounts. The revenue stream was supposed to fund this debt uh, principal account to pay the debt. Well, the debt that was issued, it, there was a mistake. So they were supposed to pay two debt payments on the same day. They didn't have the money to pay both of the debt payments, so they needed the money out of the construction account. Well, the only way to get the construction account money out was to provide the bond holder with the construction invoices. So the client called the 
called the vendor and said, if we were going to get an invoice today, what would it look like? Well, they sent them an invoice. <laughs> they presented the invoice to the, to the bondholders and they got their money released. Um, interestingly enough, we actually didn't catch it. We caught it because the construction, um, people who were doing the construction realized that their account had been depleted, but no work had been done. So we looked into it and lo and behold, that's what we found. Um, another common, or no, the other type of fraud is fraudulent financial reporting. And that's really, um, you know, just the manipulation and falsification of accounting records. Um, I think that most people don't really consider this, you know, fraud when you think about fraud in general, but there's several ways um, to commit this type of fraud. As I indicated earlier, we have responsibility as external auditors um, under Statement of Auditing Standards Number 9 that auditors are have the responsibility to plan and perform an audit to obtain reasonable assurance that the uh, financial statements are free of material misstatement, whether by error or, or fraud. So we, you know, develop our audit and plan our audit to, you know, make sure that we cover all those areas. We, uh, as uh, John kind of said, we, we also have brainstorming sessions where we'll come together as a group before we, uh, while we're planning our audit, and we'll sit together and we'll discuss, you know, where could there be fraud? You know, what areas are the most significant to the company? And we'll basically plan our procedures around those areas to make sure that we're covering anything that could have a significant impact on the financial statements. Once we determine that, we'll then link these specific accounts to fraud risk factors to make sure that we can, you know, perform procedures appropriately so that we have reasonable assurance that there's no material errors um, related to that. Um, we also have a risk to look into management override of controls, and this is a common area where, um, you know, a senior vice president comes down to an accounting clerk and says, hey, post this journal entry. Well, they're, you know, that accounting clerk thinks, well, they're the boss, I must post this entry. Well, not knowing what it is or what it's for, it's very easy uh, to commit fraud that way. <coughs> Another gray area that I've seen a lot of, or I shouldn't say seen, heard a lot of um, fraud stories is in accounting estimates because it's very easy to argue that it's an estimate. So how can it be right or wrong? And while most people think of, you know, bonuses are linked to revenue and, you know, companies want to increase their revenue and things like that, um, being in the public sector, I've seen a lot of the opposite, earnings management. Um, we have another client who gets um, federal money. So, you know, if they are making too much money, the, their funding will be decreased. So sometimes they try to increase their reserves on various allowances to make their earnings look less. While that's not really considered fraud, it's definitely a gray area when you think about the motives of the individual who are, who are recording those accounting estimates. And then any we have to consider any misstatement that we find that's of a significant nature. We have to look into the, you know, the reasons, the motives why, you know, that these errors were committed. And, you know, and in general, in external, you know, you know, in the external auditing, especially in my experience, it's not really due to fraud. It's really just due to errors um, or, you know, differences in opinion. You know, if you have an accounting estimate, you can use a valuation specialist, but in reality, it's just an estimate, so there's a lot of gray area involved in that. Um, another thing that we do is we, we have management inquiries. So at the beginning and end of each audit, we have to go and sit down with our clients and say, do you know of any fraud or have you committed fraud? Now, sometimes it's very hard to have that discussion with clients because they're almost offended, especially if you've been their auditor for several years and you've formed relationships with them it's a very hard discussion to have. Um, and then on the other side, I have some clients who are very conscientious, conscientious and the, they say, I just, have, I just have to get it out. I, I can't sleep at night. I have to tell you what's going on. <laughs> and it turns out to be one of those things where an employee has taken $10 from you know, the petty cash drawer. And um, you know, it's one of those <laughs> things where it's not that we, you know, it's not material in nature. <laughs> but I do have clients that are very willing to give me more information that is necessary. Um, we also ask management to sign a representation letter, learn about those in auditing class. I really didn't realize what that meant. But it goes through, it's about a 20-page document 
that says, I know of no fraud, or I stated this correctly, we did this correctly, we provided you everything, we did not hold back anything, and we have management sign those letters, um, I think that it's also very hard for a client to sign those letters if they know something. Um, and I've definitely gotten calls before those letters that are signed that another instance where I just have to tell you this. <laughs> um, lastly, I think that in general, um, auditors are just professionally skeptic. And this is something that I have to drill into, um, especially being a national instructor for an internship program, I have to drill into their heads. Um, if you go, you know, we talk to clients a lot, we do a lot of inquiry. Inquiry alone is not good audit evidence. So we have to, you know, I always say trust, but verify. We don't wanna be untrusting of our clients, and especially um, if you've been an auditor with the same client for several years, you get comfortable and you think, oh, they wouldn't do anything wrong. But really, you just need to maintain that objective state of mind and just realize that anybody really could do it. In general, hard is, fraud is hard to find because the people that commit it are generally very smart. So it's very you know, easy for them to cover it up. And secondly, you know, uh, in general, people don't maintain that professionally uh, skeptic attitude. Being ever the, the accountant, you know, I'm married to having words in front of me and stuff. So I've got stuff up here, but I'll probably deviate. But it's my little, my little blanket of comfort. So uh, we'll start with this, but we'll probably go in different places. Uh, first of all, does a videographer have the ability to put a Bruce Willis sort of hairpiece on me? <laughs> <laughs> you do? Okay, okay, wonderful. <laughs> if you could send me down too, that'd be even better. <laughs> um, before, before we get going, I need to figure out who all's in the room. Uh, how many of uh, y'all are uh, accounting students? Non-accounting students? Alumni. Alumni who are attorneys. Okay. Anybody from the Department of Justice? <laughs> Anybody from the Internal Revenue Service? Oh! <laughs> okay, good. Okay, I can tell my stories then. Um, let's just go ahead and flip to the, oh, let's see, where's my little flipper? Right here. Oh, there it is. It's that button okay. down the bottom. So small, I didn't see it. There we go. Okay. I'm going to dispel some myths about what forensic accounting is talk a little bit in some generalities and then I've got two cases that I can use to get us to what about five till it's fine or eight take whatever okay time. they're okay. happy to stay all day oh okay then <laughs> okay can we have lunch served uh, uh, forensic accounting is a is, is sort of a misnomer uh, what forensic accounting is it's not uh, the first time I, in, I told somebody that I was a forensic accountant they go do you ever get blood on it? <laughs> because they think of forensic files and you know, what does that mean? It means dead people, right? We account for dead, and frankly, I thought, the first time I heard the term, I didn't know what it meant either. But forensic accounting is, forensic is any professional assistance that you use, of scientific uh, uh, knowledge to use to help in, in, the, in the courtroom, in any legal process. And that's both civil and criminal. Okay, so forensic accounting is, the science of accounting and in helping, helping lawyers in the courtroom process, the sci science of, of uh, helping the judge, uh, helping the, the jury to decide financial matters. Now in the civil arena, that tends to be measurement issues, right? Um, uh, company A sued company B because they didn't get the, they got a defective product and company A saying, oh, we lost all these sales and y'all lost multi millions and millions of dollars and of course, <clears throat> Being accountants, good accounting students from a, a wonderful school like SIU Edwardsville, we know we have to drill down to what are the actual costs. It's not just revenues, right? Revenues, if you lose $20 million in revenue, that's not my loss, right? Because there's a cost associated with that. So, so as a forensic accountant, I do a lot of that. And that's really probably 85% of my business. <clears throat> um, there's two types of experts that I get hired. I get hired as either as a consulting expert or as a testifying expert. Uh, as a consulting expert, that's typically what, uh, what you see in fraud examinations. A lot of times consulting experts will help lawyers to determine a financial statement fraud. For example, there's a huge, it, it's still going on, I used to be with Navigant Consulting for three and a half years, and they have a huge engagement, a uh, multi-billion dollar fraud, and it's a, uh, um, it's a malpractice lawsuit against one of the big, the big accounting firms. And in that particular engagement, and I was a piece of that engagement. We were hired to, um, to basically go through the audit procedures and anyway look at the fraud that was committed and whether the auditors reasonably you know, had, 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 uh, had followed general accepted auditing standards and so on and so forth. 
Well, we have cons we, as a consulting expert, I have privilege, and so I can the, what, the things I do there are, are very, very, very much different. I'm sort of behind the scenes. I hand the lawyer what they what they're going to use, and then the lawyer goes and proceeds with his or her case. The testifying expert is what I mostly do. As a testifying expert, again, I'm assisting the judge and the jury. Instead of the lawyer behind the scenes, I'm actually assisting the judge and the jury with accounting knowledge. So in those cases, then it's a little bit different. I have to form an opinion. You know, you all seen, uh, dep does everybody know what deposition is besides the lawyer? <laughs> deposition is discovery. It says I'm going to testify about my opinion on this. And the other side says, okay, well, under the rules of discovery, I have a right to question you about that. Okay, so that's a lot of what I do. Uh, and then if it doesn't settle and we go to trial, then I testify in front of a jury. Uh, if it's a jury trial uh, or, or just the judge, if it's what they call bench trial. But that's what forensic accounting is. It's taking accounting it's, uh, it, and it's using it in, in a legal context, in any kind of legal arena. There we go. Okay. Types of cases that a forensic account gets involved in. Financial statement fraud, Christina was talking about that. Um, that's the, you know, the, the, the defalcation and misrepresentation in, in, a, in a financial statement and utilizing it for some benefit. Theft, uh, income tax fraud. My last case, I'll be talking to you about an income tax fraud case. Commercial damages, I just briefly mentioned that. Uh, divorce and um, accounting cases, accounting uh, malpractice cases. So the types of those are the types, sort of the types of cases, and I really broad brush those. There's tons of others. Uh, I mentioned breach of fiduciary duty. I'm seeing a lot of that right now. Um, breach of fiduciary duty and trusts. Um, you know, some, you know, grandpa has a lot of money, and um, and he, he leaves it to his son, and is and is with the with the the intention that says, uh, you know, I want you to share this with your grandchildren equally, and so on and so forth. It's called purse therpies. Um, which basically says, in addition to giving it to you, you don't have broad power, I want you to, to do this for each child. I had a case recently that went to trial in, in Cook County where dad just basically said, you know what, that was my dad. You know, you're my kid, that was my dad, I'm gonna spend that money the way I want. <laughs> and, um, you know, these are ugly because guess who sued? The daughter. So you get the daughter suing the dad, and by the way, the aunt's the co-trustee, she's there too. This thing went on for four or five years in the courts, and finally, it, you know, with delays and so on, so finally went to trial in a, in a bench trial in Cook County in May, and we're still trying to wait for the judge. But you know, there's no winners there. It's unbelievable. So anyway, there's a lot of that. You know, that's fraud too, right? It's not criminal fraud. Well, there could be some, but it's not, they didn't assert a criminal element to it. Types of work that we do, we find evidence of the act as accountants. More importantly, I think we measure the effect of the act. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Determine if GAP, General Accepted Accounting Principles, or General Auditing Standards were used. Form an opinion slash report. Then we defend the opinion and deposition and testify at trial. Um, I've got two cases here. I think I asked all the questions. Okay, I think I got where we're at here. I have two, two cases. One of them is a current case, so I have to be very careful about what I say, but let's tell you about what's going on with it. Um, I was appointed by the federal judge in the Northern District to determine the amounts stolen in a Ponzi scheme for a security broker dealer, right? Now, there's the interesting part is is uh, you were talking about like how do how do does fraud get detected? <clears throat> in this particular case, fraud got detected because the guy started to feel a house of cards coming around him, and he knew it was just a matter of time, and. He basically went to the, to the FBI, got an attorney, he went to the FBI and said, I, I've been doing some bad things, right? And so he, he basically cooperated with authorities. He's, uh, he's pleading guilty and he's gonna be sentenced in January, okay? But, when no, but because it was so easy, because the FBI didn't put, a, put a, a group in place to do the investigation, we don't know how much the fraud is. And we have one lawyer in the room uh, do you criminal work at all? No. Okay. There's a thing called the U United States Sentencing Guidelines. I was talking a little bit about this this table. Uh, in, in a federal case, there's a there's a there's a, all kinds of points you get, and, and depending on like you know whether you plead, how soon you, to the trial you plead, so on and so forth. And there's there's also how much you steal. Okay. 
they're going through this, they went through this on Madoff. How much do you steal depends upon what kind of sentence you get. And it's, it's, it's mon monetarily based. So my job in this case is to figure out how much was taken. And so it's a little bit, it's a matter of measurement. So I'm gonna be going in, I'm not gonna be, you know, I have the, the, the bad guy is gonna be totally, you know, forthcoming, unless he tries to hide, he might try to hide stuff, right? Because if, if, he, if it's five million, he's gonna get a, a different sentence than if it's three million. So, um, but that's a matter, matter of, uh, you know, it's 10 years. He basically, he brought, you know, people started investing with him and he got greedy and he realized there was a lack of control within his little brokerage firm. He could, you know, with the, the technology that you have now, you can, you can print broker sta statements and get, you know, shoot, you can take their fonts, right? Do a cut and paste, you know, take Bank of America's font, put it on, I mean, you can do all that stuff, right? <clears throat> and the, the uh, his victims were, you know, guess what? They were friends and family, right? Trust, that's how, that's how fraudsters usually, usually get it, is, is through trust. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, uh, you know, his life is in shambles. His friend's life are in shambles, and and you know, he's probably going to go to jail for, you know, five six year sentence. And and, and and as I was mentioning, in club fed, when you get a five to six year sentence, you serve eighty five percent of it. There's none of this early parole stuff. So, um, the interesting thing about about fraud, and I just I just attended the AICPA fraud conference in Boston last week, and one of our sessions it was just fascinating. It was a friend of mine who's a professor at uh, Kennesaw University, he's a certified fraud examiner as well, has a background in accounting, but has a PhD in quantitative psychology or something. And he was talking about the fact that, that really fraud is about psychology. It's about taking advantage of people who trust you, right? About taking advantage of people who trust you. And so whenever you talk about you know management override of internal control, and you can have the best internal control system in, in the world. But at the end of the day, it's about you know human beings making mistakes, feeling pressured, and uh, and and how many of you are familiar with the fraud triangle? Fraud triangle, okay. Pressure, opportunity, and rationalization, right? Okay. Think about the economy we're in right now. Uh, pressure. Is there more pressure today than there was five years ago on individuals and companies? Talk about individuals, right? <clears throat> how many people know people who are out of uh, you know who are out of work? Or who, who were out of work themselves, right? There's financial pressure on individuals. There's financial pressure on companies. Okay, well, just public companies? You gotta get their stock market price up? No, how about privately held companies who have bank debt? Who have the, the lenders, anybody from working a bank? Besides, well, Seth's not working. Bank, 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 bank. Okay, <laughs> bank. okay. Uh, you guys, you know, violation of loan covenants, right? You're looking to see how healthy your, your businesses are that you're lending money to. Um, you know, and if my if I know I'm in violation of my loan covenants, you know, what's the, the, there's that pressure, all right? The opportunity is a simple matter of in, you know uh, of internal control, uh, and, and when there and when there's a lack of internal control, people are like we're like little rats, right? There's a piece of cheese outside. I'm gonna figure out how to get that piece of cheese. There might be little tiny crows, but that that's human people, human beings are gonna do that. And then the rationalization is in the bank loan covenant sort of um, sort of example. Um, well, you know what? I'm not. Who am I hurting you? I'm not hurting anybody because you know what? Those 40 people out in the plant are going to have a job by me telling a little white lie to the bank. And you know what? It's only one month, right? <clears throat> That's how fraud. And it's always fraud always starts off in little chunks, doesn't it? Always starts off in little chunks, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and that's pretty much true of every fraud, whether it's financial statement fraud or uh, uh, you know embezzlement, et cetera. Okay. So we're getting we'll go to to my one last slide here. I think that's the last one. Okay. I'm gonna end up has anybody heard of uh, Anderson Arkin Associates? Tax fraud case out of Washington? Besides Jeff? I think you've heard maybe you didn't know. I did this one I, Jeff and I were colleagues at UHY. Um, anybody here a tax specialist? Tax accountant? Okay. All right, well you can correct me if I say anything wrong here. Um, Anderson Arkin Associates was a, this was a case out of, this was a case I was a testifying expert on in, in Washington State. Um, it was a fascinating case for me. Anderson Ark was a tax scheme that a bunch of, that, that basically an ex-IRS agent 
and a, another convicted felon patched up in a halfway house after they were completing one of their federal sentences up front. Okay? And they hatched this out and they said, you know, we can, the IRS agent had enough information, to, the ex-IRS agent had enough information to know how to work the system and how to util, utilize the Internal Revenue Code, uh, you know, to, to their advantage to basically paper up transactions that look like they're right, but there's maybe one or two little small elements that aren't right, which of course is the house of cards. You take out the two cards and the whole thing falls through. So Anderson Arkin Associates started in the late 90s, and what it was was it, it was it was a program that got investors, you know, they would go out to holiday inns all over the country and, you know, we're going to help you save taxes and everything. And the idea was to get wealthy individuals who were paying lots of tax, pr primarily small business owners, to be able to take the same creative advantages that the big companies have, right? You know, big companies do this all the time. They don't pay taxes. They form multiple corporations. They have management agreements. They have multiple entities. They put their real estate in partnerships. You know, they have LLCs. They have all this stuff. We're going to help you do that because you know what? You deserve it. It's you know it, you're, you you're oppressed. You know you got really some of the stuff was pretty aggressive. So about and I, this is where I, I think 1,500 people across the country got involved in this at various levels of income and basically invested in this business. And I'll talk a little bit about the investment in that. My part to this was <clears throat> they had these six pretty much six principals who were doing this on then some minions, right? And they needed to have an, some accounting people on board, some CPAs. So they got some external CPAs, four CPAs, to be involved in doing the tax returns for these programs. Well, since we're getting run short on time, I won't go into the great detail. But um, it involved, uh, they had two programs. They had a look back program and a look forward program. I was primarily focused on the look back program. The look back program says, look, the, the, the Internal Revenue Code allows you to create basis as a partner when you have a partnership interest, right? You, your basis is generally what what you pay for the for the partnership interest, what you contribute. But the law also allows you to increase your basis for bank guaranteed loans, right? So if the partnership goes out and borrows money, and you're a partner, right? And you and you sign Scott A. Stringer, I pledge to you know to pay all this back. Right? You now, to the extent, when, when that partnership then has a loss, you can take a loss to the extent of your basis. If I pay you $100 for a partnership interest and it loses a million, I can only take $100 deduction. But if I have a guarantee on a loan for a million, I can take a million. So that was the premise. The wealthy people got involved. Where did this, the, the bad guys, what did the bad guys do? Bad guys charged a big fee for it, right? charge lots of fees, so on and so forth. So they, they make millions and millions of, roughly about $50 million, I think. Um, and it, between that and the, look, and the Look Forward program. So CPAs, anybody ever heard of RICO? RICO is a wonderful thing that says guilt by association. And if you're working with bad guys, you must be a bad guy. So the four CPAs were indicted under RICO. Um, by the way, this all came crashing down in 2002. The IRS had 30 investigators, or Department of Justice, and IRS had 30 investigators, FBI, IRS, for work for two years on this, right? They infiltrated the organization, they figured out what's going on, and boom, everything came crashing down. Um, they got the main guys in Costa, were in Costa Rica, brought them back to trial, and let me, let me tell you this, this is, this is funny, two years without bail, right? These are not murders, these are income tax bills. Anyway, these are the bad guys. My guys got out on bail, four, four CPAs. But, so the four CPAs are invited under, uh, indicted under RICO. Skipping down down to the to the bottom, what did I do? I did not measure the loss here, okay? But but what I did as a forensic accountant is, and this is also necessary to do in the courts as well, is what is expected of a CPA. My testimony was everything was right about what they did. The two things that were wrong was that the bank in Costa Rica were for the bank debt to to uh, to, uh, uh, to guarantee there was no bank, okay? And the other thing that, that created a loss was a business that was held by the, not, not the CPAs, but the bad people. Um, that business was non-existent. As a CPA, you go in, everything papered up great. Everything papered up great. The only thing that wasn't, I mean, you know, you would have had to get on a plane to go to Costa Rica and find out there wasn't a bank there probably. 
Okay, but it was all not. It's all <laughs> mystical and magical, right? Oh, it's in Costa Rica. They got different laws. Okay, I got the seal. Okay, and then you sort of stop. And then, and then uh, the second thing was the bona fide business, and they created statements and something. Unless you go and visit it and see what's going on, you really don't know that. So, uh, make a long story short, um, the six bad guys all got uh, all went to jail. Uh, one of them later got two of them later got out on on appeals. Um, the, the real bad guy got 20 years in federal prison. Uh, each of them got 42 million in restitution, which means when they get out of prison, they're going to be like OJ. They're going to have to, you know, sell everything, etc. And my four folks uh, got a hung jury. Um, they, uh, the sad story is, is that when they figured out that the, only one person believed my story, that, that, that you know, and then 12 of them did, they decided, you know what? Before we get retried, we're going to go ahead and plead guilty. And so they, I think they ended up going to jail for between one and two years, but and with zero restitution. So CPAs and forensic accounting fraud, it's, it's rampant out there. By the time I get involved, you know, it's usually messy and expensive, and, but it's quite interesting. You know, whether you get into, whether you get into uh, uh, auditing, whether you get into internal auditing, whether you get into corporate accounting, um, you're all gonna be faced with fraud, fraud uh, opportunities that are gonna happen around you because of the pressure, opportunity, and <coughs> So just be aware of that. Thank you.